Good morning and welcome. It's time for another edition of Inside Oakwood with Dr. Leslie Pollard. And we want to say good morning to Dr. Leslie Pollard. How are you doing today? I'm feeling great. <laughs> <laughs> good morning, Donna. I'm just feeling on top of the world. As they say. Me too. Dr. Pollard, I haven't felt this good in so long, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just the ability to exhale. Right. That's how it feels. It feels like you could finally exhale and, and feel some kind of optimism, some kind of hope about, you know, life. You don't go to bed thinking, OK, is he going to push that button, you know, or I, literally I have thought that I've gone to bed. like, I know, okay. <laughs> I know what you mean. I know exactly what you mean. I've got lots of friends and lots of friends on both sides of the aisle that I'm, I'm talking to now. Of course, my friends who are on my side of the aisle are very excited. And my friends on the other side, I'm saying, you know, we did need to turn a corner. And I mean, even, even they are admitting that we needed to turn a corner. So, so, I mean, we got a lot of great things happening. And I think for us, what's important is for us to continue to pray for the country, to pray, yeah. for, pray for the transition, pray for, pray for all the things that will make our country, um, make our country live up to the purpose for which it was formed. You see, right. I think that's important. Right. Well, you have a word for us today, a special word. Now, this is, this, is, this is really providential. This is really providential. So I'm reading, you know, Donna, you and I have been talking about this a little bit. So I read a chapter a day um, in, in my devotional. So this yeah. morning, uh, right now I'm in 2 Samuel, right? So I'm in 2 Samuel. So now 2 Samuel is a story of how David is trying to unite the kingdom. And David has all these enemies. Um, so one of his enemies is someone named Sheba. And Sheba is not the queen of Sheba, but a person named Sheba. And, and this person is actually trying to kill David, trying to assassinate him. Because right. David is trying to bring it. So, so Sheba goes to a town to hide. And that town is called Abel. So he went through all the tribes. He's stirring up. He's fomenting insurrection. He's doing all those things. And he went to Sheba to hide. Okay. So now David has a general. And that general's name is Joab. And Joab is the guy who does whatever David needs to do. He's the hit man. He does it. Now, David may not do it himself, but he's the hit man. So when Absalom, David's son, was in rebellion and the other people wouldn't kill him, it was Joab who killed him. So Joab goes to this town of Abel and he's looking for Sheba. Now, that's the point. He's looking for Sheba. So the Bible story, and I want you to listen to this. Now, the Bible story in 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 16. Um. So they get to Sheba, Joab and his troops come in verse 15, and they surround the city and they make a dirt ramp up to the wall and they use a battering ram and they start battering the wall. So now a lady comes and looks over the wall. And this is where the story picks up. A wise woman shouted from the top of the wall, listen to me, this is verse 16, listen to me, I have to talk to Joab, tell him to come here. And when he came, the woman said, are you Joab? She said, she, he said, yes, I am. She said, please listen to what I have to say. I'm reading from the contemporary English version. All right, he said, I'll listen. She said, long ago, people used to say, if you want good advice, go to the town of Abel to get it, Abel, to get it. The answers they got here were all that was needed to settle any problem. We are Israelites and we want peace. You can trust us. Why are you trying to destroy a town that's like a mother in Israel? Why do you want to wipe out the Lord's people? Mm -hmm. Joab says, no, no, I'm not trying to wipe you out or destroy your town. That's not it at all. There's a man in your town from the hill country of Ephraim. His name is Sheba, and he is the leader of a rebellion against King David. Turn him over to me and we will leave your town alone. Mm. The woman told Joab, we will throw his head over the wall. <laughs> <laughs> she went to the people of the town, um, talked them into doing it. Mm. They cut off Sheba's head and threw it to Joab. Wow. Joab blew a signal on his trumpet and the soldiers returned to their homes. Joab went back to David in Jerusalem. Mm. So now, if I was preaching on Sabbath morning, I'd say, if you'd permit me, I want to talk about women of influence. You see that? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a story? Oh, Isn't that, that, a, up. Oh, yeah. Isn't oh, that a story? <laughs> so, so, so one of the pictures we see coming from the Old Testament, from the Bible, people have very stereotypical views of the role of women in the Bible. 
Mm -hmm. That's because they're not reading the Bible. Right, right. So you, they, once you read this story, so who is this lady? She doesn't have a name, but obviously she's a person of influence. And if people have been coming to that town to get wisdom, she's one of those wise people. It yes. sounds like they're coming to talk to her. Wow. And so the lady goes back to the town. She has to gather all the elders together. And she says, look, we got something we got to do. This man, Sheba, that you all have been concealing, this insurrectionist, we're going to cut his head off and we're going to throw it over the wall in order mm. to say, okay, y'all y'all not listening to me. This we listen. Week. Come on we're now. Throw his head over the wall in order Absolutely. to save the town. Wow. Wow. There's a, wow. Lot, there's a lot in this story. But yes. what I'm going to say is what we witness when we open the Bible, mm. Mm -hmm. that tremendous women of influence mm -hmm. who, who exert leadership and direction it's amazing. So what I say to people who have very, very stereotypical views is, could we agree that we'll just read the Bible? Mm -hmm. just, and it didn't just, start. Yeah, we'll just read it. Let's just it started read it. in the Bible. And yeah, and see what it says. And once we see what it says, then we come away with some conclusions oh, that God is an equal opportunity employer. Right. We right. The conclusion that God puts his anointing upon whom God wants to put his anointing. That's right. We come to the conclusion that God is the one who makes the selection and not us. That's what we come to. We come to those conclusions as we work our way through the Bible. So wow. that's that's our story this morning. That's our story. <laughs> that that was amazing. And and you know what? I can't wait to hear that sermon on that. You know. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. This that's is good. this is a this is an amazing story. And I'm just so inspired by how she went back. And I, I've been to Israel and I know how small some of these little villages can be. And to gather all those elders together and say, look, we've got to make a decision. Clearly, she exerts leadership. Right, right. What she promises and what happens, Joab withdraws, goes back to David, and they've got the enemy, the insurrectionist, they bring him back. And as a matter of fact, according to this story, you bring him back and he's he's hanged, he's executed. So, yeah. and, and again, that's another thing about the Bible for all of our listeners. The Bible is a brutally truthful book. It doesn't, it doesn't gloss over what actually happened in those days. So when I think about that, I think about women of influence, I think about uh, vice president, isn't that something to say? Vice mm -hmm. president Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris vice president Harris. of the United States of America. And people are rejoicing in all the in, in various communities. The Jamaican yeah. community is rejoicing. African American community is rejoicing. The Indian community, community. Mm -hmm. is rejoicing. So many people are rejoicing. Because, and little girls are rejoicing because they right. get to see themselves yes. in her. What a wonderful thing. And I, I just mm -hmm. wish her mother could be here to see it all. I That's know it. And yeah. you know what? We, 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 we're we all rejoicing, but we've got two AKAs on the line, too. And I know. Oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> okay. Dr. We Banner Wilchcombe and, yeah. and Dr. Karen Ben Marshall. And I just want to hear what their perspectives were and, and what their takeaways were from yesterday, seeing our Vice President Kamala Harris be inaugurated as our next Vice President of the United States. Go ahead, Dana. Well, we are so excited. We are on the edge of our seats about this because Alpha Kappa Alpha, the purpose of the organization is to cultivate and encourage high scholastic and ethical standards, right? Mm -hmm. To mm -hmm. promote unity and friendship among college women. Yes. And a part of what we do is service. We want to demystify the myths of what you think we're doing. And we want to get down to the outcome of what you see that we're doing. Mm -hmm. We service the community in any capacity that we are called to do that. And we do it all because of unity. Yeah. And we don't do it alone. We started out when, when, with women's suffrage. We had everything to do with voting back in the 1900s. We have a brother organization, Alpha Phi Alpha, that, op that started in 1906. And two years later, here we come at Howard University at 1908. So part of what we do is cultivate these high standards in women so that we can have the Kamala Harris's, so that we can have the Coretta Scott Kings. And there's so many more. Dr. Karen Ben Marshall sitting right here with us as a member of this great organization. So we are on the edge of our seats, but we are not surprised. There's so much more to come. This is just the beginning of what you're seeing now. There's so many women in leadership that so are members of the fine organization. 
So we can just consider that our vice president has accomplished mm -hmm. the epitome of what AKA is. Uh, so Dr. Karen Ben Marshall, tell me what your feelings were, what your takeaways and, and what it really meant to you to see this happen on yesterday. As Dana said, it's, it's just so exciting, so exhilarating. We just celebrated our birthday of 113 years of this organization. You know, our founder and, and, and our in court and the corporator of the organization, as Dana said, you know, women's suffrage, that, that's where we really started. You know, we were really influential in terms of women's rights. But Kamala Harris has a first in so many different ways, first African-American, first South Asian woman, you know, first attorney general, now first vice president, just so amazing. But I was watching CNN last night and what really struck me, there were, you know, there were parents showing their young ladies just talking mm -hmm. about this experience. But there's one little girl that said, this gives us legitimate girl power. <laughs> legitimate girl power. I'm like, I got to use that. <laughs> like what? He said legitimacy to that girl power. And, I, and that's, that's how I feel about it. And, and we talk about this being the, the tip of the iceberg here, but you know what? African-American women have played a major role throughout this whole process. And maybe Marcia and, um, and our other young lady, uh, Dean, can talk about this because African-American women, we are responsible for President Biden getting in the office as president. We, well, let's say we may play a major critical role <laughs> in making sure that that happened as well as Kamala Harris. So can you all speak to that and talk about some of the activities that you all have been doing uh, leading up to this point? Marcia? I, oh, no, go, go ahead, Bree. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, um, yes, Black women have definitely carried this election, especially Miss Stacey Abrams in Georgia. Exactly. Um, without her, I don't even know if we would have the senators we do now. I don't know if we would have been able to flip the Senate. So I think it's important to pay Black women their credit. And I think it's important to know that it's not above us and it never has been. So I think that um, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to be a part of that demographic. And um, from a USM student standpoint, what we've been doing is, as a lot of you know, last year we held our voter registration drive. And these circumstances were a little different because we're in a pandemic. So normally it's, you know, fun. Everybody's out. But for safety reasons, we could not do that this um, last year, but we were still able to register over 400 students in the uh, pandemic. Amen. I think that is notable that, you know, we had a lot of first time voters and they were so energetic to not only be educated on why this important, why this election, excuse me, was so important for us as being African Americans, but I also think it showed how important it is being at HBCU and kind of giving back from how we were built. And I'm going back to Vice President Harris. I think she kind of, not kind of, she did. Mm -hmm. She broke a lot of glass seals. Mm -hmm. One for women, one for women of color, one for HBCUs. Being at an HBCU, you hear people say, um, you know, HBCUs don't prepare you for the real world. Mm -hmm. How are you going to, you know, <laughs> get a real job? What are you going to do after H? What are you going to do after you go to Oakwood Debris? And I think Kamala, without even saying a word, denounced all of that and became vice president of the United States. So that just shows you going to an HBCU prepares me just as well as an Ivy League school, as a PWI, as a community college, whatever you want to throw against an HBCU, we can handle it. Mm -hmm. And Kamala here shows that. And sometimes, let me just throw in here that we think that our Adventist schools definitely don't prepare us for politics, but that's not true. And I think Marcia can speak to that. They're prepared for that as well, right? Oh, wow. Yes. Um, that's a, actually a very good point. And it's, and it's kind of sad and it frustrates me at times when we look at our religion, specifically Adventists, and they say politics is the devil. You know, <laughs> anything with lo um, lawyers are liars. It's all bad. And it's like, no, Jesus, right? who is what we all aspire to be, like Christ is our advocate right now <laughs> before the throne of God, advocating for us um, with his righteousness. He's a lawyer. That's what he does. <laughs> he's, the, he's the best example ever. Go, so I, I, I definitely want to 
<laughs> remove that myth that law and politics and anything related to it is of the devil. No, this country even, when we look at the constitution, it was founded on the principles of the Bible, right? The right. entire constitution for my biblical scholars, you read the book of Deuteronomy, the entire constitution literally came from the book of Deuteronomy. All right. So it's definitely parallelisms. But going back to your first question, this this moment is literally, as I've said in previous interviews, is history. We get to see history in the making. And it's just such an awe feeling. You know, I am very, very elated to be from Atlanta, Georgia, because Georgia, we we did we did it this year. You know, when you look at Stacey Abrams and Keisha Lance Bottoms and um, just some of the robust movement that happened in Georgia that pushed everything over to the edge towards the positive future that we're seeing right now. It's mm -hmm. just awesome. Um, and then we think about the suffrage movement. Any movement that you can think of, there mm -hmm. were Black women that were working behind the scenes that did not receive the recognition in the history books, but nevertheless, persevered and continue to this day mm -hmm. to work, to advocate for equality, for justice, for all. And so as a professor, especially in the history and political science department, where we're grooming people to work in government and law, it's just so phenomenal mm -hmm. to be able to sit here and listen to my students say, I want to be the secretary of education. I want to be a diplomat. I want to be an ambassador. I want to be a Supreme Court justice. I can look at them and say, you can be exactly what you want to be. Mm -hmm. Not only because you are, first of all, proudly an HBCU graduate from yes. Oakland University, yes. not only because you're a female or even a Black female, but just the fact that you are a human being Amen. and you live in a country where our forefathers had the dream that we would all unite and grow together. So it's, it's, it's wonderful, it's a great feeling. And now I can see dreams becoming a reality. Wow, mm -hmm. awesome. And In people pursuing lifetime. the students pursuing those dreams because they see that it is possible now, you know? Were you gonna right. say Dr. Wilchka? Oh, gonna I was say? just gonna say in our lifetime. And I wanted to add to that. Again, it did not start here. And I'm going back to what Dr. Paula just said and really brought the point to light. Before Kamala, we had Deborah. Before Kamala, we had Miriam, we had mm -hmm. Esther, we had the reformer Huldah, and we had Lydia. So this is just a line of women that we need to uncover in the Bible that already existed. We already had our power in the word mm -hmm. of what women were doing. This is just one more in the line of what women are doing and what we're capable of and uncovering the truth that already existed in the Bible that demystifies the gender roles of women. Mm -hmm. So not only HBCUs, were you calling out people who were AKAs? What, I mean, oh, those were women in the Bible I just called out. Bible, okay. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm sorry, we got to start there because it, it, it starts somewhere. It didn't start with Kamala, but it, it's all, it ended up with her right now. Yeah, because she stands on a lot of shoulders of mm -hmm. other women who have come, like Shirley Chisholm, you know, uh, people like that, who, uh, you know, sh that's who's, who's more contemporary people that she's standing on. Mm -hmm. um, but listen, on the Bible, in the Bible as well, the AKAs, though, and other sororities are preparing. Tell us about the, um, the influence that you feel the sorority has been on helping build and shape Kamala Harris to be the vice president. I think that one of the things that are one of the tenets of the organization has to do with women's suffering. Of course, we have many different programs. One of the bigger programs was Stroll to the Poles, where we had a united effort with not just Alpha Kappa Alpha, but with all of the Panhellenic Council, Divine Nine of other organizations that came together for this sole purpose. Mm -hmm to make sure that everybody's registered, to be actively engaged in the process of getting people to vote, to be on the ground, in the front line, in the kitchen, behind the scenes. And there, there are so many people in this organization that come together mm -hmm. for, so for this particular cause. Right, but, right. You, but you know what the other piece of that, too, is our current um, international president, her focus has really been on HBCUs and really bringing to that forefront and in giving financially. So every year, our organization, we all get together and we give millions. I mean, we gave we had a, Dr. Pollitt should speak to this because right. recently the um, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated gave 
funds to Oakwood University because of this push to, to um, support um, HBCUs. Wow. Wow. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the donation by, by Alpha Kappa Alpha was just an amazing gift. Uh, Dr. Glenda Glover, um, who is a colleague of mine, president of uh, Tennessee State, has done a, a tremendous job in making sure that the organization fulfills its service purpose. And that's an easy one, right? Because you think about the service mission of the organization is compatible with what we are about at Oakwood University. Right. Um, and that is the, the calling to service. You know, I, I wanted to say one word about the, the role of HBCUs in our society. I did an interview yesterday with some local media and uh, I, I mentioned to one of the young reporters who didn't know much about um, HBCUs. One was an HBCU uh, reporter and the other was, uh, was a Caucasian young woman who went to another school. But, but I began explaining to her the role that HBCUs have played in American society. Only 3% of all institutions of higher education, but graduating 19, 20, 21, as high as 25% of all African-Americans who receive bachelor's mm -hmm. degrees in the United States. And we began to scroll down these statistics and I could see her kind of wide-eyed with wonder and delight as we began talking about all of the judges and justices that go from H that come from HBCUs. And then the Howard University reporter asked me a question, what would you say to those who say HBCUs don't prepare people for the real world? I'd say, well, okay, um, where is the evidence for that statement? Because mm -hmm. I start naming people, right? Just start naming people, including one of the most heroic Americans in the world, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Mrs. Coretta Scott King, yes. what makes you think that they were ill-equipped to inter interface with, he's a Nobel Prize winner. That's okay. an internet, but again, but, but the fact that we have to be on, uh, I see it, Professor Burden is here, that we have to take the witness stand to defend HBCUs is a part of the problem. So what I said yesterday, I hope I wasn't too strong. I said, that's really just bias at work. Because okay. if you look at the evidence, the evidence is just the contrary. There is a confidence, there is an exposure that we pour into our graduates that, it, that outfits them to stand in the halls of Congress and now even in the White House. So that's an amazing presence and purpose and, uh, and an amazing outcome of the HBCU community. It's a village that produces these illustrious graduates from all stri of all stripes and strata around the world and they go out and they not just make a dollar, they make a difference. And that's, that's what I love about HBCUs. Yeah, so you know, and, and and are, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and like I told um, somebody yesterday, you don't understand the HBCU experience, the quality of it, unless you attend one, mm -hmm. right? And so my plea to everyone is if you were thinking about, mm, maybe I should do an HBCU, maybe should I attend that type of university, try it out for a year, mm -hmm. just one year and see how the community, the village, the support, the training, the one-on-one, -on -one, right? You're not just a number, but mm -hmm. I, when I attended Oakwood University, I was Marcia Burden. Mm -hmm. I wasn't just that student in my class. Mm -hmm. And that kind mm -hmm. of image and identity you carry with you for the rest of your life. Wow. I also, I also tell this story over and over again about attending an HBCU. And I'll never forget, my mother had passed away the February, before I was supposed to attend school in August. So there was a significant change in the family's income. So that affected my financial aid. And I'll never forget the financial aid officer pulling me to the side again, Marcia, by name. And she said, Dana, I'm going to take care of this. And this woman worked tirelessly to make sure I was enrolled in school. And I waited patiently. Of course, it's an HBCU, so you're going to learn the fruit of the spirit, patience. So I waited and waited, and I never, I went to school, never missed a semester and was cleared. And that one particular woman made the difference in my life. And in fact, she was the person that encouraged me to want to work for an HBCU. Mm, mm, mm. That's amazing. So you wouldn't get that at another school wow. because one of the things that we do at an HBCU is guide our students, yeah. advise our students and prepare our students. Mm -hmm. And that, a, a part of what I got is what I'm giving back through an HBCU. 
Yes, and that's so much we can read. What the benefits? That's what we're talking about, the benefits of uh, attending an HBCU. You know, uh, we're looking at some of the comments of the people that are watching right now. And Lois Speaker says sometimes she thinks that uh, we are, HBCUs, are more prepared than other schools because uh, because we do make a difference. And that's really, really important. Uh, Lewis Jones is saying, I love my HBCU, Oakwood University. And uh, also, we have someone listening and watching from Little Rock, Arkansas, and just appreciating all of these comments that we're having. And, you know, we can't finish this comment, this this uh, discussion without bringing up the name Amanda Gorman. Y'all know yes, Amanda? Yes, the young poet. Yes. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. She had me on my feet. I was at home and I was like, what? <laughs> Listen to those words. And, yeah. and, you know, another influence, another, you know, powerhouse person. She's only 22 or 21 years old. And, you know, I kept thinking, I don't know if anybody ever said it in on the news um, yesterday, but, you know, last time when we had, I think it was Barack Obama, who did the poem then? That that was um, Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou. <laughs> Maya Angelou. Can you, I mean, Maya just think Angelo. about that. She is, she is taking, she is in her footsteps. She was in her footsteps yesterday. And that's just amazing to me. That's how I think about it. But listen, we are just so excited. And, um, you know, we know the HBCUs have, have a great influence and we have more and more work to do. So as we go forward, Dr. Pollard, what are we going to be trying to focus on to keep that momentum going? Where, where should we, we be focusing? Well, first of all, we should continue, of course, for, Excellence is its own its own gratification, right? So, so, so we will continue here at Oakwood University in our pursuit of excellence. And each of the persons here represented today embodies a certain quality of excellence. So that's an important thing. Then we will continue to grow our programs in policy and advocacy because we really believe that entering into the world of public service is also a ministry. One of the things I like about this the the countries that have the the, the former British. Um, the former British Commonwealth connections. Um, when they talk about education, it's the Ministry of Education. When they talk about um, um, security, it's the Ministry of Security. You find that in the in the countries that were formerly the holdings of Britain and consider themselves a part of the British Commonwealth. Um, we, we want to talk about the ministry of advocacy, the ministry of serving in Congress, because that's really what it is. Mm -hmm. And President President Biden made it very clear yesterday as he was swearing in, <clears throat> as he was swearing in, many of the employees said, remember, the people don't work for us. We work for the people. Mm -hmm. We work for the people. And that's a part of what we, we, we want to continue. We need Daniels and Daniels. Yeah. <laughs> we need Josephs. And we need Josephines. Mm -hmm. we, 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 need, we need all of these persons in the public space doing advocacy. And I'm grateful too. Our North American division is publishing a document that's about to come out. I'm a member of the writing committee in which it actually, for the first time in the history of our denomination, it actually says we support young mm. people especially who see a calling to public advocacy and public service. We actually support that and we encourage that participation in our society. So I, I think as we continue to grow our programs and to invite all to consider Oakwood University as a place for your training, it'll be the launching pad. From here at Oakwood, you could get to be the chaplain of the US Senate. You could get to sing yeah. for president. You could do all of these things right here from this HBCU in Huntsville, Alabama. You could Oakwood. be an international opera singer. Well, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful discussion we've had about the 2021 inauguration on yesterday. And just want to leave you all with this word. There is always light if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. And I think Oakland University is being in the light right now. So thank you, Dr. Pollard, for being with us. And thank you to your guests uh, for being with us as well. And we'll see you again next time for another edition of Inside Oakwood.